Okay, today, everyone, we're going to talk about um, construction safety, particularly focused on the AC Level 1 exam. Uh, so I'm going to have the, back, the module uh, from the AC, uh, AIC, here in the background, and I'll bring in documents that will illustrate some of these points. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, the first aspect that they talk about is safety culture which you can see over here on the screen. Um, my point on this is that, you know, it, it, in order to really make it an important issue where it's at the forefront of everyone's mind, all the way from the people doing the work in the field to executive leadership, it's critical that executive leadership and the top of the company uh, reinforce that message on a continuous basis. That's the only way to create a culture. So I've shown you over here an example of the safety commitment letter that Tellepson and the safety committee have created uh, to communicate with everyone that safety is of utmost importance. A lot of times you'll find people that uh, it's, they're talking about in this section right here is that, you know, it, it, there is a cost associated with putting a safety culture into place. But it's been my experience that when you do have an accident, it costs a whole lot more uh, because it slows down the job for one. Uh, secondly, it uh, it costs you're losing general conditions time during that, that slowdown. And if you start having repetitive accidents for, for three, um, then what can happen is it can reduce the efficiency on a job site. So these are hidden costs, but So there's another point that uh, needs to be made with accidents and the financial cost. I want to show you this little graphic here. Um, the Texas leads in the total construction fall fatality by state. So that's partly indicative of the amount of construction that goes on in, in Texas but it's not a good category to be leading the nation in. So uh, your company just simply cannot afford to take safety lightly and uh, it takes everyone to make a good safety culture all the way around. So uh, let's talk about OSHA in terms of when it really went into effect and the important parts of OSHA that pertain to construction. So in 1970, as you can see here, um, the Occupational Safety and Health Act went into uh, effect. It was designated by the federal government, so it is a federal requirement. And anytime you have a federal requirement like that, and we'll talk about later in the module, there can be stiff penalties for failure to comply. It is run by the Department of Labor. Um, and the U.S. Code of Federal Regulation um, is called the CFR, Code of Federal Regulation. And the OSHA standards, which are, if you've ever gone online and Googled OSHA standards, they are enormous. I mean, you can look forever to find information on them. But if the things that relate particularly to construction, as I've noted here, are Title 29, Part 1926. These are where all the construction related items are. And then if you see here, there are other applicable sections, but they're more generic. There is the 1903 OSHA inspections uh, section. There is the 1904 OSHA record keeping inspection. And then the 1910 general industry. One other important thing to note about OSHA is that it is codified or certified by ANSI, which is a uh, global certification agency to, to tell consumers 
that they are up to a certain standard. The uh, record keeping, obviously if you have standards and you have the ability to fine people, the standards uh, will require that record keeping be done. And there are three very significant forms that have to be completed by any general contractor to uh, state that your OSHA regulations are being monitored and they are being dealt with. There's the OSHA 300 form, there's the 300A form, and then there's the 301 form. Now, note that this is required from any companies that are 10 or more full-time employees. So, the 300 form, shown right here, is a form to record all reportable injuries and illnesses that occur in the workplace. The 300A form is basically a summary report of all those injuries. So, in this particular detail, the 300 form is more detailed. Um, so, what I was saying was is that the 300 form is more of a detailed form and then the 300A form is a, a summary type form and then you have the 301 which is uh, gives you more specific details about how and why and the details behind why that accident occurred uh, or that illness occurred. So those are the three basic forms that you have to uh, adhere to in order to um, satisfy reporting requirements for OSHA. Next we have, um, it's important to understand the distinction between how OSHA classifies an injury or an illness. And the first, the first thing you need to know is that first aid is not considered uh, an injury or illness, uh, minor first aid. So, and these things that are highlighted in yellow here are those aspects or those occurrences that are considered to be an injury or illness. And they're death, days away from work, restricted work or transfer to another job. Say for instance, you have a worker that hurts their hand uh, while they're trying to put scaffold up and the hand required stitches or surgery and they're not able to do manual labor anymore. And so instead of, you know, you move that person, he can do other type of works or she can do other type of work. And so you move them to a less strenuous job. So this is where that, that's what this clause means here. Um, loss of consciousness, automatic, you've got to report it. And any injury that is diagnosed by a licensed healthcare professional. So it's real important that when you're re reporting these things, that you make an assessment on the job site of what classification it is first before you send them off to a licensed professional at an ER or uh, uh, a healthcare facility. Communication with the employees. Uh, basically, the, this act was created for the purpose of creating rights for these people, for the workers. And so because of that, not only do you have to keep internal reporting, but you have to post some of these things at the job site. So there's this poster here that's called It's the Law and it informs each individual worker of their rights. Um, then you have to provide the 300A form uh, posted on the job site. And if there is a citation, which talking about here, it has to be posted at least three days or until the hazard has been abated or corrected, whichever is longer. So those are the minimum reporting requirements that you need at a, at a project. <clears throat> Let's talk about some of the other specific things uh, that are required and to be on hand and available to the employees. The hazardous uh, communication of safety data sheets. Now for those of you who've been in construction for a while, we used to call these the MSDS, which is Material Safety Data Sheet. 
They've just now recently upgraded it and dropped the material off of it. It's just simply safety data sheets. They are one and the same thing. And they are required to be on the job site um, in a binder so that any employee, let's say you send one of your foremen out to clean a trailer and you tell them you want to use bleach. Well, if they're concerned about what the safety requirements are for bleach, they can ask to see that safety data sheet. And I, it, this may seem trite, but there are people who, whose lungs do not react well with chlorine. And so this is a way of keeping everything on site that shows what each material has the potential side effect for so that you don't, you don't inadvertently or unknowingly put an employee at risk. Competent person is the next topic. Um, <laughs> this can be used in a generic sense, but in the case of OSHA, it's very specific. Competent person means that you have a requirement to have at least one, one competent person per job site. And they define competent person as someone who can oversee the health and safety of the project. Now, some of those requirements are, as you see up here, they must be able to identify existing hazards and anticipate future hazards in the workplace. So the example I'm gonna give of that is, let's say you've got a competent person on the site and you're doing trenching and excavation for some major plumbing lines and you've got the soil benched back to match the soil uh, type requirements, and it rains. And uh, let's say that sandy soil, which is very loose uh, and has the potential to be knocked out of its pre-rain condition. And so that competent person would need to go walk the site before it's opened back up after the rain to assess whether or not it's truly safe uh, for working to recommence in that trench. That's a, that's a very classic example of having a competent person and the kind of work that they would then do. This person uh, has to be qualified through formal education or practical experience. And I'm, I I'm not gonna delve into the details of what you have to have in order to be qualified as that but they also have to have the authority to stop work and make corrective measures. Now, I talked earlier about citations. There are four types of citations that can be issued and basically they are characterizations of the safety violation. Willful means that the employer purposely disregarded or was indifferent to the employee's safety. Uh, so this can be, uh, you know, let's say a worker goes to the foreman and says, hey, you've got a floor opening here. There's no tape around it to notify the employer. Somebody could step off into it. And say several workers came and told them the same thing. If something happens and a worker falls into that trench and hurts themselves, then that would be considered a willful violation. A serious violation, which is shown right here, is if it's a serious accident that could result in death or serious physical harm. Repeated is that they've been cited multiple times on a, on a violation and then the one that's the least serious is other than serious <laughs> a little intuitive there duh um, the company's rights once you get a citation are listed here and you can petition for modification it's called PMA petition for modification of abatement or a notice of contest NOC and you basically have 15 days of issuance of the citation to make your case that perhaps the citation is too stiff, that you had been doing corrective actions and it just was one of those uh-oh type moments 
or whatever the case requires to demonstrate to the federal government that you really are taking safety seriously. Let's go now to the focus four. OSHA talks about basically the four primary um, instances where you have accidents. And they are falls, struck by, caught in between, or electrocutions. Falls is probably the most common. And uh, I, I put up a little thing here on the left-hand side that shows you a little info piece that showing that about death being caused by falls, it is the leading, falls is the leading uh, situation where death does subsequently follow. 31% of them come from the roof, 7% from steel, 15% from scaffolds, 24% from ladders, 6% from the lower levels, non-moving vehicles such as an aerial lift, 7%, and 5% from the floor or ground dock level. It's an interesting stat. Um, so fall protection is a very important aspect that your company uh, should be focusing on with the workforce. Then you've got over here struck by, and um, I've actually been on a job site before where a, a person had iPods. Sorry for the slight interruption. It's in the middle of a COVID-19 uh, crisis and just had a phone emergency phone call from one of the hospitals. Anyway, I was just about to talk about um, struck bys and we actually had an incident where with the construction workers using those ear pods uh, to listen to their their music or their Apple phone or whatever uh, had him in his ear and did not hear the backup beeper on one of the trucks so this is the struck bys are, are a, basically a situation that with the in, invention of modern technology are causing some new and different issues. And so uh, I anticipate that that will probably be um, scrutinized a lot more closely. I know that we have. Um, the other two types of focuses are caught in between, such as in trenches and then electrocutions from uh, uh, aerial power lines or underground duct banks, either way. So let's go on to PPE. Uh, for those of you who have worked in the field, you're probably very familiar with this. PPE is an obligation that the employer has uh, to provide employees with the appropriate hard hat and safety vest. Uh, you know, they don't, some companies provide footwear, uh, some don't. A prescription eyewear is another form of PPE and weather specific clothing. So um, those are issues that um, uh, of different PPE that are out there and need to be provided. So uh, let's go on then to portable fire extinguishers. And uh, this is really an important thing for you to uh, memorize. Uh, there are five different types, and I've put a, a, a little diagram here on the screen to show you the different types that they're categorized. A is for combustibles, B is for liquids, C is for electrical equipment, D, combustible metals, and K for kitchen fires. And you'll notice that the the reason why they do that is that the composition of the materials inside the fire extinguisher has performs a chemical reaction to whatever you're trying to put out. And so they're all different classifications. So you always need to select the ones that are appropriate for the type of work you're doing. Uh, they've got a little deal here that talks about an easy way to remember it. A is for ash being combustible. B is for boiling, for liquids. C is for circuit, 
for electrical. D is durable for most combustible metals. And then K is for kitchen. So that's a pretty easy way to um, remember uh, the different classifications of the fire extinguishers. Notice that the rating on them here, a 2A means that it's a type A and it's the equivalent of two and a half gallons of water extinguishing capacity. So that's, that's basically saying it's the same net effect of using a unit of water. We're gonna have two and a half gallons of water come from not water itself, but the equivalent of that come from this particular type of extinguisher. So that's the safety, that's the rating that you'll see on most uh, fire extinguishers. The other more, other important point about fire extinguishers is travel distances. You should not exceed more than 100 feet on a job site uh, for your fire extinguisher and they need to be mounted three and a half to five feet above the floor so that they're readily visible. Okay, let's go on to electrical. Um, electrical is primarily associated with avoiding, uh, you know, high uh, power lines, uh, particularly if you're lifting something if you're doing uh, lifting steel or precast tilt panels uh, up onto a site uh, and you are within 10 feet of a high power line, that's a very dangerous condition to be in. Uh, sometimes the equipment jerks and you're creating a risk situation for the persons operating the uh, uh, equipment, the lift equipment. and. Electricity does have the ability to spark, to arc, uh, and to latch onto other areas. So uh, the minimum requirement to stay away is 10 feet. I know uh, at Telepson we impose a 20 feet distance line uh, just to be on the safe side. The other aspect of um, electrical is to isolate the electrical components and particularly the way that we do that is through lockout tagout as you can see here most of you that have worked in the field are probably familiar with this but basically you put a box on an electrical circuit uh, so that people can't open it and deal with uh, electricity unless they're authorized to have a key and generally the only people that have access to those are typically your superintendent and your electrical foreman. So uh, that's a very important aspect of uh, electrical safety, just as, as for an example. Here are some other things, GFI circuit outlets um, for equipment, uh, having, you should never have a damaged extension cord on the site, and particularly one that you've taken duct tape to that is not an approved extension cord. So uh, those are some of the things that they're looking for relative to um, safety for electrical. Scaffolding, scaffolding because it relates to falls is probably one of the most important aspects on the job site. And uh, you all know that there are several type of scaffolds. There can be a supported scaffold, meaning that it's got uh, uh, supports on the ground uh, that are anchored to the ground or either anchored to the building. Uh, suspended scaffolds are those that are like the overhang scaffolds like you use when you're putting up the exterior veneer of a building. And then aerial lifts, okay? And I'm gonna show you here, this is a picture of a uh, suspended, uh, a supported scaffold from the ground. Um, they have screw jacks here to screw them up and down in place. Uh, very important aspect of these, they, you must have a tow board and this tow board is for the purpose of not allowing the workers to kick materials off and fall onto other people that are walking around the scaffold. You have to have appropriate guardrails and you've got the appropriate, have to have the appropriate ladder access 
uh, so that it's safe to get up on top of the scaffold. Now with these type of scaffolds, there are a lot of rules, okay? And it's very important to stay focused on these rules. Um, when you put planks down, you can have no more than a one inch gap between adjacent planks. Not overlapping planks such as this way, but adjacent planks such as this way. So um, that is one important consideration. The, uh, the scaffolds themselves must be able to support four times the anticipated maximum load. So if you're loading masonry or block or whatever material onto that scaffold, you need to take those weights into consideration. The, um, it must be at least 18 inches wide. And the planked platforms, when we're talking about the overlap, uh, must be at least uh, 12 inches or greater. And this is so that you don't create an uneven load when you step on it and you cause it to do this or this. So um, those are very important things to understand about scaffolding. Uh, and we'll probably see those on the test. Uh, here's an example here of the overlapped. It's not appropriate. Obviously, this isn't 12 inches if you look at it to scale with the rest of it. Um, let's go here. Suspension scaffolds. It's basically like a swing stage. Um, counterweights must be on those. And they must be done with non-flowable materials such as sand, gravel, or metal weights. Aerial lifts, uh, which you're familiar with, like cherry pickers, broom, boom trucks, or um, just an aerial lift that you'd rent, um, those are another aspect of scaffolds that fall under this category. In fall protection, the leading cause of fatalities uh, is falls, which I've mentioned that before. And so these rules apply to anything that's greater than six feet in height. Um, particularly of note, and bring this little exhibit over here, is fall arrest systems. And these fall arrest systems uh, relate to how far you fall before it keeps you from hitting the ground. So um, these are some of the guidelines. Um, the systems themselves, and you see another picture over here of how they're intended to work. You must have a point, which is A, C, which is the lifeline, B is the body harness. But it's very important when you design these systems for your job site that you have them in such a way that um, they're designed to support 5,000 pounds for each worker. Now that's twice the impact load or twice the impact load. So you have to understand that if you start falling, you have not only the weight of the person, but the momentum with which the person is falling. So that's why these parameters have been set uh, to this strenuous um, and high level. Um, Guardrails, guardrails have to be installed for the scaffold system. And you can see here that I've got in here the requirements for uh, guardrails. You also need to know that at the top of the guardrail, they need to support at least 200 pounds of lateral pressure. pressure. And that's basically configured to be, you know, for the average or the largest size construction worker applying pressure to those guardrails. Safety nets are another aspect and they are typically done in uh, high rise construction and they're intended to lay out from the edge of the building. If this is the building here, the safety net would be like this adjacent to the floor and um, so these are the parameters, and it, they're intended to catch people um, 
before they fall off the side of the building. So it's an additional lever, uh, addition, belt and suspenders sort of approach. So um, the, let's see, they must be drop tested and they're drop tested by dropping a 400 pound bag of sand at the highest surface of the potential fall hazard um, to make sure that they work. So they have to be tested before the competent person can certify that they're installed correctly. Um, excavation, which is probably the, more, the most common aspect. Oh, and by the way, here's a diagram of the safety net in case you were curious and my hand motions weren't sufficient enough for you to show what it was. Um, excavation, uh, it's probably the most common. Uh, the biggest, the biggest uh, hazard is asphyxiation, uh, which basically is suffocation. Um, since the soil weighs as much as it does, I think average is 1,500 pounds per square foot, it doesn't take much to fall in to asphyxiate a person. So uh, that's why the sloping and shoring of these areas is so very, very important. And I'm going to show you this diagram here. Uh, this is a really important diagram and we've talked about the different types of soils, uh, type A being the most stable. Uh, so therefore, they're allowing you to do a three-quarter to one. So for every three-quarter of a foot horizontal dimension you have, you must have at least a foot vertical dimension that it's sloped back. Uh, when you go to type B soils, it goes to a one-to-one -one ratio. Zoom in on it. You can see it there. Okay. And then on type C soil, which is the least stable, it's one and a half to one. So you can see that they progressively get wider uh, as the soil becomes less stable. Uh, these are important rules to follow. And um, there can be instances where if it's deep enough, that you have a multiple bench back system like these diagrams are showing. Okay. Um, so those, you need to know what those are because those are pretty commonplace. You're going to encounter this probably more times than you can imagine uh, in your careers. Um, so I've talked about benching. Temporary spoils, uh, this is another very important thing. Um, they can be placed no closer than two feet from the edge of your excavation. And there's a diagram here that shows that. Here's the temporary spoils. You have to have a two foot minimum. To me, that's a little tight, but that is the requirement. Um, so uh, that's that on that topic. Then we're gonna go to trench shoring. Shoring is where you can oftentimes find uh, cofferdams. I know we've talked about cofferdams and estimating. Uh, it protects the trenches from caving in. These are situations where your excavation is greater than 20 feet. Um, or let's say you're working in a high water table and you need the uh, excessive strengthening of the sides of your trench to be able to keep the soils from coming in and collapsing. Um, so you can see here it shows you this is the sheeting that goes in. Here are the whales, the horizontal members, and then the struts that connect it either back to the soil or you place them in here like this to create a basically an opening that pushes against the soil to keep that area open. Um, Trench shielding is another method. These are typically done out of pre-manufactured boxes that are out of uh, some kind of metal uh, to prevent soil from collapsing. So there's multiple ways to get around it. You can use either wood or metal. Wood is typically when you build the trench shoring. The trench shielding is generally with metals. Uh, 
probably the most important thing that gets overlooked is access and egress from these trenches. And so um, trenches that are deeper than four feet require a means of getting in and out of them. And the ladder must be at least three feet above the top of the trench. This is because it gives the worker something to hold on to as they're climbing out of the trench. And the travel distance can be no more than 25 feet to the nearest ladder within that trench system. Um, this is some of the information it talks about ladders, how they need to be, particularly here on the ladder angle and extension. Uh, they must, ladders must be able to support at least four times the maximum intended load. And if you lean them against the wall or any other place, they need to be at least three feet above the upper landing surface. Okay? So, we have now been through the safety guide on construction safety. I hope you found this informative. Um, it should help you get ready for the AC Level 1 exam. And as always, uh, you can reach out to me through my website at coblescorner.com or through the university email. Thank you very much. Y'all have a great day. Bye-bye.